Hello everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today. We're going to be talking about something that I've kind of hinted at in other videos and referenced but never really dove into at least until now. So we're going to be discussing emotional sadism what it is, how it differs from physical sadism, where they overlap, how you can incorporate emotional sadism into your BDSM, common kinks associated with emotional sadism, as well as how to come to terms with your sadist side. So if that sounds good, stick around and we're going to go ahead and get into it. So first of all, I do think it is difficult to come up with a concise definition for sadism or somebody who is a sadist because when you go to google or look in a dictionary the typical definition you will find is something along the lines of a sadist is a person who gets sexual thrill from hurting others and i don't love that i think for me that reads as more non-consensual more medical more serial killer e if i'm being honest and so i prefer to use a little bit more of a both broader and more specific definition to separate out clinical sadism as a disorder from consensual sadism done in a bdsm context so for me i think about sadism or a sadistic person as a sadist is somebody that enjoys in a physical, emotional, or mental way, they enjoy inflicting consensual pain on others. And I like that because it doesn't just focus on it being for sex reasons. We all know that in BDSM you can enjoy it for many reasons and also because it emphasizes the consensuality of the act. However, even though I do think this is a better definition, though it is a mouthful, obviously, I still think that it could be more precise in that I think when you're looking at either definition, most people are going to immediately think of only physical acts of sadism, right? You know, pulling somebody's hair, spanking them, flogging them, whipping them. Unless you get very particular, most people are not going to associate mental and emotional things by themselves as being sadistic, even though they very much can be. And it's interesting because I think many of us know intuitively from our own experiences that pain can be way more than just physical. We have experienced maybe the burning sting of embarrassment or the sledgehammer to the chest sensation of being rejected by somebody that we care about or the dull ache of disappointment or the dull ache that can go with a really long crying session. We know that there can be a physical manifestation of an emotion in our bodies and also that that, that can be felt like pain. And I don't want to quote this as a definitive authority, but and if I find it, I'll put it on screen. I do remember seeing some brain scans that suggested that emotional pain is felt in the same part of the brain as physical pain is. So clearly the two can be related and thus exploited consensually as part of a BDSM scene. And so for some sadists who are more of emotional sadists as opposed to physical, what they enjoy about doing a BDSM scene is not like the bruised bottoms or like the thrill of wielding a cane on someone, what they enjoy is that mental and emotional aspect like what I just mentioned. It's not really about the physical anguish, it's about the mental anguish. And yes, people that are emotional sadists can also and do oftentimes enjoy those other components of doing a scene, but for a lot of them, the primary motivator is that emotional and mental component, and without it, they wouldn't necessarily enjoy the kinks that they're engaging in. And in the reverse as well, a lot of physical sadists are also emotional sadists. We've probably had tops, or we've been around people, or maybe even ourselves, we might be tops that, you know, we love a good spanking scene, and the crying is just the cherry on top. But the difference for an emotional sadist is that 
the crying, the weeping, again, the agony, it's not the cherry on top. It's not a side dish. It's not a nice thing to have. It is the purpose for the seam. The caning and the bruises are the side dish for an emotional sadist, not the main course. So it's kind of opposite than I think what a lot of people would assume from just standard default sadism, so to speak. And I think it's also true that a lot of people who would fit the emotional sadist label naturally tend to reject it because it's already hard enough to come to terms with being a sadist at all in our culture. I think I would know that. I have gone through that process myself. It's a lot of doubt and guilt and shame and wondering if you are a bad person. And when you are drawn more towards physical sadism, I think it's a lot easier to defeat the arguments you might have in your head about it. It's a lot easier when it's just physical to go, you know, well, I like being a sadist, but like, look how happy it makes my partner. Look at their big smile. Look at how much they come. Like, look at all of these physical signs I'm getting emotionally that my partner is enjoying what I'm doing. Whereas when you're an emotional sadist, though that is always still there, the consent is still there, it's buried a level deeper where your brain and your eyes are going to see the tears and your ears are going to hear the begging, no, please stop, mercy. You're going to get all the sensory information that's telling you this person doesn't want this. This person is in distress. And for a lot of us, hearing that distress is just like an instant like, oh no, I'm a bad person, I should not be doing this. Even though we know consciously, because we negotiated for it, this person we're hurting right now in this moment, they want it, they enjoy it. That emotional masochist bottom, they want to be able to scream, no mercy, please stop. They wanna be able to have the tears ruining their makeup, but it's harder as a newer sadist to look at that and go, I'm still a good person. This person wants it. Like it's so hard to defeat the training we've had maybe growing up where I think, and this is well intentioned, I'm not saying people shouldn't do this. We're all given that messaging about, you know, hurting other people is bad, right? Hurting other people is wrong. And I think that messaging is there for a reason, but it creates this mental stop for a lot of people. And I've seen this time and time again, where their partner can be begging them, like, please take the flogger, hit me with it, I like it, I promise. And I'm like, no, I can't do it. That would make me a bad person. Hitting people is wrong. And it takes so much freaking work to dig yourself out of that. And I wanna honor and recognize that coming to terms of being a sadist is a big process. And if you are in the middle of doing that right now, I'm proud of you. I'm glad you're trying to do things in a good, positive, consensual manner. And it's okay for this to be a struggle. So before we get into talking about how to do emotional sadism, I first want to work through the process of how do you come to terms with being an emotional sadist? What does that actually look like? How do you get through somebody swearing that you're an evil bastard up and down and remind yourself that this is all a good positive thing ultimately at the end of it? And I think the number one thing any sadist can do, and I've kind of already said this, is to focus on consent. Consent, consent, consent. And I know that there are people that much prefer nonverbal communication and would much rather go with the flow and just feel the vibe. But when you are playing in really deep, dark waters like this, if only for your own sake, if not for anyone else's, although you should be concerned about what they feel comfortable with as well, it is always better to have consistent verbal affirmation that you and your partner are doing this because you both actively want it. That means having very thorough negotiations before a scene about boundaries, limits, preferences, fantasies, all of that good stuff, establishing things like safe words and other tools you can use in the scene to communicate to make sure you know, okay, if my partner isn't wanting this anymore, I know they have an option to be able to stop this that I, I can rely on. And I think you can also use tools like in-scene check-ins and communication to make sure that people are still wanting it. That could be you know, green, yellow, red. It could be a one through 10 on a pain scale. And if you wanna stay more in character, you can do things that are more role play heavy, 
role play focused. That way you can communicate without breaking the scene space. I think a lot of people overlook that. Like you don't have to just be like, all right, so pause the interrogation. Let me, how you feel on a scale of one to 10? All right, put it on this form. All right, <laughs> sign here. <laughs> like you don't have to do that. Although I guess maybe having somebody sign paperwork in an interrogation scene maybe makes sense flavor wise. But for most scenes, that's probably not gonna go very well. But have something where you can really rely on. So you can check in with your brain and go, hey brain, remember the thing that we're doing? These are all the signs I have that this person actively wants this. And because I like them and respect them and trust them, I am going to trust that they are telling me the truth when they say that they want this. And so this does require a leap of faith emotionally on your part to accept when your partner says they want something. So I always kind of try to think about it like, hey, I respect my partner as an autonomous adult. I know that they will tell me when something is wrong. I am going to accept at face value when they actively tell me repeatedly that they want something. And I'm gonna choose to have faith in that and to not be controlled by my fear of feeling guilty or ashamed that I might be doing something wrong even when I have all of these other signs to the contrary. Now. When it comes to defeating that more invasive thought pattern of hitting people is wrong, I am a bad person because I hit people and no matter what, it's always wrong. I think that is a lot more difficult to work through. I think even when you're dealing with that, you might wanna ask yourself questions about like, okay, well, is it really always wrong? Like, like what about when somebody is begging you to do it? What about when somebody wants a cathartic release? What about when you know it brings your partner physical pleasure? And I would think possibly even of trying to shift the value you have into a more compatible value, where instead of holding this absolute statement that hitting people is always wrong, you can change that into maybe a better version where you still, you know, you're not just wantonly doing whatever you want. You know, you're just going crazy flogging people in the grocery store. Like you're, you still have a level of restraint, right? Maybe you change that from hitting people is always wrong to hitting people without their consent is wrong. You know, just a really, really simple, just lexical tweak there to make that work a little bit better within a BDSM framework. And I think also it's important to keep in mind that obviously just because you are feeling something even, and maybe even especially when that feeling is very intense, you're feeling a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of regret after you do a scene, just because you're feeling it that intensely doesn't mean the degree of feeling is justified in reality, which then you know kind of goes back to, okay, does this fit with what I know about what this person said beforehand, during the scene, afterwards, and choosing to have faith in that reality over like your fear, which is amplifying all these emotions up to like the highest possible setting. And honestly, if you are somebody that is dealing with like a paralyzing amount of guilt and shame, where like, again, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whoever is begging you, like, please vlog me, please step on me. I want this, it would be so fun, just do it. And you also want it consciously because that's important, but you are prevented from doing it. Your brain's going, well, I wanna try this, but I shouldn't because if I did, I'm bad. Like if you're stuck in that place, there is no shame in seeing a kink aware mental health professional to help you work through that and have a healthier relationship with yourself and with your partner where you both get to explore things you want to explore together without having that impediment in the way. And that's a whole other subject that is a complicated process. And I know that everyone's gonna have access to that, but if you do and you are struggling to that degree, there is no shame whatsoever in pursuing that. Now, changing subjects, I not only wanna talk about how physical and emotional sadism are different, but also how being an emotional sadist is different from being a dominant. Because I think, especially when you're newer to BDSM, almost all of the media around BDSM is like dom, 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 dom. And you very rarely hear the term sadist. Like I think the only time you hear it is like, 
50 shades of gray and that's obviously not great right that's not good representation by any means and so i think naturally people go okay so a dominant what do they like they like being an authority they like having power and control over a scenario that could be something an emotional sadist like too right an emotional sadist likes power and control over other people therefore dominance are emotional sadists and vice versa but i i don't think it's necessarily that clear cut obviously people can be both but the nuances of what the person does or gets from having that power control and authority i think matter i think somebody that is more motivated by dominance wants to be a leader they want to guide someone into doing something being a better person being trained in a certain way providing a certain service they are there as the leader of the relationship and having somebody underneath them that can be guided by them that will follow them i think this can also be related to like caregiving for example as well like caregiving is a form of dominance for a lot of people whereas i think with emotional status exclusively they like power and control because of the way it allows them to manipulate and control people's emotions and having permission to do certain things to another person they might for example be more motivated by being able to say no to a submissive's pleasure right like they might get kind of a kick out of being able to tell their submissive partner that you know you're not allowed to have your favorite soda for two weeks and it not just being about like a health thing but also being about like a hey you're gonna suffer emotionally because i'm taking away this thing that you like they might enjoy being able to act more arbitrarily or capriciously and getting to verbally tear down and tear into their partners for forgotten rules and making mistakes with protocol or rituals they like having that framework for getting to execute on their sadism it might also be the case that they're into it because there's something about the dominance and submission that is emotionally degrading and they enjoy being up here as the dominant and the greater and the more powerful and the worthy and their submissive is degraded by being submissive they are lesser than they are weaker they are underneath them not everyone who is a dominant or a submissive feels degraded by their dominant position or by their submissive position i think this is something i've actually seen quite a number of people be very confused about is they go wait when you're a submissive you don't do it because you feel like a sack of dirt on the floor <laughs> like no not always some people definitely do but a lot of people feel very elevated in their submission they feel like it's their purpose and they're, they're worthy because of it and so that level of emotional sadisticness is not there with all forms of dominance and submission what do people do as emotional sadists i've already talked about a few different categories of play i've talked about crying objectifying people degrading people verbally berating them tease and denial play as well the things that fall under the emotional sadism umbrella are actually pretty diverse like there's a lot of kinks you probably already doing that you don't even know are related to emotional sadism but there are many other ones out there and by the way just quickly i do a video about crying fetishes if you want to know more about how to make somebody cry as part of a scene because that is a really 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 good way to test the waters of emotional sadism it's just to see how you feel when your partner is actively crying during a scene now i personally as a bottom like i cry all the freaking time like if i don't cry during an impact scene it's like i didn't even have an impact play scene but i know other people like they don't cry as much during play either because it's like difficult for them to get there or it's just not their reaction to play but trying to provoke crying on purpose can create a very unique experience and give you a chance to kind of savor that moment and rest with it and see what it feels like to cause someone to cry but some other common kinks associated with emotional sadism besides just crying fetishes is things like humiliation sissification forced femme stuff embarrassment 
degradation. Actually, there was a term I was recently introduced to that I'm I'm not sure how I feel about it. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Consensual gaslighting, where like, I don't know, you like you, you drop something in front of a person and you're like, why'd you drop that? Like, I get why you'd call it that, but also could we maybe just call it like, I don't know, mind fuckery or reality denial or something. Like, I feel like we don't have to confuse more terms in BDSM with non-consensual abuse tactics, you know? I just feel like we should move away from that, but that's my opinion. Uh, some other things that are common with emotional sadism would include fear play, kidnapping, interrogation play, mindfuck you already said, ignoring people, boredom play. Those are all some common things that you'll see within emotional sadism and some more uncommon things as well. And there are other kinks as well that are not exclusively emotionally sadistic or thought about in an emotionally sadistic framework most of the time, but definitely can be done in that way. I think cuckolding is one of these. I think water sports is. I think human furniture play can be as well. There's ways to do those kinks where they fit into other things. Like for example, a lot of people maybe enjoy being a piece of human furniture because they're a service submissive and it's like a service act for them. Whereas other people are really into it because it's like degrading to be an ignored lamp in the corner of the room. And so different perspectives on why you're doing a certain king can really change what category it maybe falls under. And I think even something, for example, like praise kink can be a form of emotional sadism because yeah, some people love being praised, want to bask in the glory of being told what a good kitten they are. Whereas other people, like it's almost a form of humiliation play to be told like, you're good, you're worthy. And having that kind of like cringe revulsion of, oh no, no, please stop, please stop, no, no more. like. Seeing and interacting with that can also be a form of emotional sadism too. But also, not every emotional sadist is drawn to particular acts for their sadism. This goes for physical sadism as well, right? Like some people are like role play or reaction junkies and they're not really into like just caning or just flogging. They want to use whatever tool will get them to their ultimate goal, right? Like if they're really, really into crying again, like they maybe don't care if they have to use a flogger or a paddle or a cane whatever it is that gets you to cry. Other people are very much into the role play aspect of being an emotional sadist, where they want to do emotional sadism through a particular role they might play, like the really strict school marm or the mean high school queen bee or the impossible to please instructor or the disciplinarian, right? There's lots of, especially more, I think, femdom roles that get associated with emotional sadism, but any kind of role play we're taking on kind of this like more distant, detached, cold, or like mean-spirited role, I think re works really well for emotional sadism. But you can also totally turn this on its head too. Like you can have an emotional sadism scene where you're acting the opposite of what one would expect from somebody in that position, right? Like you can be an emotionally sadistic caregiver. You can be an emotionally sadistic pet owner, like in terms of role play, you can be an emotionally sadistic mommy or daddy. Like it doesn't just have to be a really direct one-to-one -one correlation. It can also be sort of this inversion or perversion of expected roles. Now at this point, if you've heard enough about this and you're like, I want to try this for myself, how do you get started doing acts of emotional sadism? And maybe for you, you came to this video because you have a partner who's like, oh my gosh, I really need you to humiliate me, please do it. And you're like, okay, what do I do with that? And that's totally fair. So I think if you already know a particular category of play your partner is super into, I think the next question to ask yourself is like, what do you want to get out of the experience? What does your partner want, right? Because in the realm of humiliation, there's so much to do. You got to kind of narrow it down first, right? Like, are they really into like, 
verbal sparring, being verbally told, like, you know, being, you know, told they're ugly or being, you know, kind of ridiculed and laughed at, you know, on like a stocks in the middle of the dungeon. Like, are they more into that with their humiliation or are they more into being made to do embarrassing things? Are they maybe more into, you know, being made to wear like too small clothing for a girl and they're like, you know, a six foot guy. Like, are they into, you know, being made to like clean the floor with their tongue or something? Like, what can you do with that? Maybe for you and your partner, you find out, okay, we're both really into the idea of being made to do embarrassing things. How do we then do that? And I don't generally recommend you do things in the vanilla public, but I think for this case, this is a potential good example. So maybe you're both really into humiliation play, you wanna try it out, you've never done anything before, you're not part of a dungeon, you don't really know where to go. I think you could, for example, turn your regular Friday night date night into a humiliation experiment. It'd be like underneath your clothing, you know, on your chest or something where it's like, for sure not ever gonna be seen by somebody else. Like you write like embarrassing statements or words on the person, like, you know, worthless, the sissy or whatever. And you write that on them, have them covered up with whatever clothing you're gonna wear, and then you go about and do your normal dinner date with, you know, the hidden secret of the, the bad naughty words underneath the shirt. That's a really like simple way to engage in BDSM and experiment in a familiar setting doing unfamiliar things. Now, if you have absolutely no idea where to start, but like you and your partner or like somebody you wanna play with at least, like you're like, okay, we wanna try this, but what do we do though? Cause I'm not really sure what sounds good. I think you can look at maybe other kinks that your partner has and maybe make some decisions based off of that. Not eliminating any other possibilities, but choosing what to focus on for now. I think if your partner is a little or a pet or the person you wanna play with is a, is a little or a pet, I think, one really common thing I know a lot of people enjoy is praise kink. And I really like this one as a newer kind of introduction into emotional sadism because even when it doesn't work, it still kind of works, right? Because you can try it and your partner might not feel humiliated from it or might not feel bad about it, but they might still enjoy being told good things about themselves. So even like the fail state for it is like, pretty good, especially considering like emotional sadism does have a fair amount of risk behind it. And we'll talk about that. And you might already know your partner likes being called a good pet or a good girl or a good little thing. But how would they handle that if you dialed it up to 11 and then it was like super mushy, over the top, ooey gooey, you know, romantic sitcom levels of pet naming where it's just like a flood of like positive comments. That might go from the, oh, I like this to, oh, could you stop please? I'm embarrassed, stop mom, no, stop, don't please. Like it's, it's potentially something where you can get into embarrassing territory even when the person already likes being praised in other contexts. And if you wanna take this to another level, you can kinda like, clockwork orange them into being forced to hear it, right? You can put headphones in their ears that get taped over them. You can put them in a cage where they have no hope, no escape from hearing nice things about themselves and just have to sit there and take it. <laughs> that can be really fun on a lot of levels. Now, in the opposite direction, if you have somebody who's more of a service submissive, I think the key way to be an emotional sadist to a service bottom is to give them an impossible task, something they have no hope of succeeding at. And I think a good example of this is like, you open up maybe a, a, a big bag of like unpopped popcorn kernels and you spill that all over the floor, right? And you have them pick up every single grain, maybe have like one hand tied behind their back, maybe have them do it with their mouth, you know, something where it's gonna take them a long fucking time to do. And then maybe right as they're done, you tip over their bucket again, or you put more on the floor, or you throw some kernels on the opposite side of the room and they have to like hobble over on hands and knees to go get it. Like you can make that scene last a really long time. And maybe, I just thought this on the fly right now, maybe what you can do is you can take behind your back, you just keep one kernel, right? And then because they're on the floor on hands and knees doing this, you just, put it up on top of the fridge 
or in the cabinet or something like out of sight out of mind and you just keep going this one you haven't picked up yet you're still missing one you dumb go pick up all the kernels you missed one you missed one and just drive them fucking nuts not being able to find that one popcorn kernel now have a time limit on this you know don't do it for 10 hours like build something in the scene that you've negotiated for we have like you have one hour to find all the kernels and put like i don't know a big 80s alarm clock somewhere in the corner with like a countdown timer on it or something and oh, there's 30 seconds left they haven't found the popcorn kernel what am i gonna do and then right as the timer clicks down you go this isn't the one you missed. <laughs> and if it's an edible thing, you can make them eat it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just full of free scene ideas. This is like personally my specialty. But that is what I think is a really good thing to do for messing with a service sub. As a service sub, I've got some ideas in my back pocket. Now, brats are interesting because brats are more challenging, right? Brats typically, they are difficult to punish with physical things because lots of brats are masochists and they enjoy being hit physically and so to punish them physically isn't really a punishment. And so though it might seem difficult at first for like how are you gonna get through a brat emotionally, they like things, what does a brat want? Ask yourself, and if you're a brat you know this, what does a brat really live for at the end of the day? What do they want more than anything? Your attention. <laughs> So the way to be an emotional sadist to a brat is to ignore them. Put them in a cage with a blindfold on, force them into corner time, put them in a room and then go play video games. You know, if you want to make sure you want to do this in the safest way possible, you want to tie them up in bondage or something, you can tie them up in bondage, put a blindfold on them, put them on the other side of the couch or like, you know, like you're here and they're there, put them away from you physically, but still in eyesight range. And then like ignore them when you play video games or make phone calls or watch a movie or something. And if you want to be really mean, you put in earplugs. So that way, like in them, so that way when you're listening to the movie, they can't even really hear what's going on in the movie either. Board and play and being ignored all in one package. I'm sorry, brats, but didn't you kind of ask for it? Yeah, sorry, but not really sorry for the brats. So with emotional sadism and with all of these suggestions, I think I need to be very, very clear that this can be very risky emotionally, obviously. It is very important that when you're playing with emotional sadism, you have very clear boundaries around what is okay to play with and what is not okay to play with. So Typically what that would mean is I would stick to what is called an opt-in negotiation style. What that means is everything is off the table except for these very particular things that are on the table for the time being. And it's only for that scene you negotiate on a scene by scene basis. And I think this does a really good job of avoiding the typical problems of like, well, you didn't say that I couldn't make you wear a blindfold. Like, no, it's very clear ahead of time. This is what's allowed, everything else is enough. So I like to stick to that. And if you're worried about a partner like knowing too much and it's spoiling the scene, you can have some space between your negotiation and the actual scene. You can throw out like a bunch of elements in a scene you're not actually gonna end up using. You can use blindfolds, sensory deprivation, misdirection, music, you use lots of tools to create more suspense and intrigue in the scene, even while still having very clear negotiation skills. And I just think for me personally, like why add an extra layer of like non-con fear play to a scene when it's not necessary and it's not wanted? That's how I think about it. Like I always think communication up front is going to give you the best scene possible. And even if you're doing an opt-in style of negotiation and you're talking about limits and boundaries and that, I think it's also important to keep in mind something that I got this idea from Midori and I apologize because I don't remember exactly how Midori referred to it, but I will call them emotional pillars. And essentially what an emotional pillar is, is it's like the core parts of yourself that are important to your identity, right? So you might really, really value as a core part of your identity, your intelligence. And so 
for the sake of a humiliation scene, you would not want to touch on your intelligence being insulted, but you might be perfectly fine talking about your physical appearance or vice versa, right? Different people have different pillars. And so in order to facilitate like the verbal role play of a scene, I think doing an establishment of your emotional pillars with your partner is really important. So that way, when the top is in the moment in the scene and trying to like improvise to keep the mood going, they don't inadvertently step on something that they shouldn't have said. And this is really important. If you are an emotional sadist, do not abuse people's stated pillars. The pillars are not goals. They are not things to knock down on purpose. They are boundaries around things you cannot touch, all right? Don't ruin your partner, don't ruin your scene you're doing. Stick to things outside of these pillars as opposed to treating them as goals to knock over. I also think kind of one final note here with emotional sadism, if you wanna do this, is aftercare is so important because when you are doing a physically sadistic scene and you're getting all these hormones going, you're getting all these good body high feelings going, that can help you kind of skate through some of the more difficult parts of sub drop or top drop. It can also make them worse, but it can also make them a lot better too because you've got those endorphins to rely on. Whereas with a scene that is just about emotional sadism, uh, shit feels bad and it is bad. Like, it, you, you are crying and you feel bad physically, emotionally, everything all the way down potentially. And so that means you have a much deeper emotional hole to crawl out of if you do end up experiencing sub drop or top drop. And so you really got to make sure you're talking about what your needs are for aftercare, setting aside time for that. I really think especially with emotional sadism, one aspect of aftercare that is important is to reconnect with that person in a different emotional headspace after the scene is done. Doesn't have to be the next day, even the next week, but at some point reconnect and do something together, watch a movie, get lunch, get a coffee, go to a Bilderberg workshop, I don't care, go somewhere where you can connect emotionally and be reminded, oh, they do want to spend time with me, they do like me. And that goes for both parties in a scene because as the bottom, you might be feeling really torn up, like, oh my God, they really hate me, they think I'm stupid, why do they want to be around me, I'm horrible, I'm the worst person ever, they were right, and as the top, you might be feeling, oh my God, I'm horrible and awful. Why did I say those things? They probably hate me. They probably think I'm a douchebag. I, I shouldn't even try to be around them. And the only way to fight those feelings is verbal confirmation from your partner and seeing each other in a different context where you can go, oh, they do still like me. They are still my friend. Okay, okay, things are actually good. But I think something that can be really precious for like more established relationships after a really intense emotional scene is to have each partner write each other like genuine heartfelt notes about like I care about you I'm so happy I trust you this much I'm so excited about getting into this scene these are all my actual thoughts about you please remember this and exchange those notes and so when you're recovering during aftercare separately if you have to do that and you want to do that you can read those notes and then be reminded oh right this is how they feel about me. See, it's kind of like the theme of this aftercare is like getting grounded in reality about how your emotions actually are about a person. As a final red flag note here, I will say, if you are doing emotional sadism and you're doing sadistic things with a partner and you're doing it because you want to act out a genuine hatred, disgust, negative feelings towards your partner, huge massive red flag. I'm not a therapist, I can't tell you not to do something or that it's always definitively a bad idea, but I would be very, very cautious if you want to do a scene with a partner because you genuinely want to humiliate them because you actually think they're gross and bad. Like, why would, why, why would you want to play with somebody that you dislike that much? Why is that? It's not fair to them either. Like, it's just, it's bad vibes all around, honestly, but bad vibes being noted and warned about. I think that is all I have to say for this video. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me and, you know, being here in this conversation. I would love to know your thoughts in a comment down below. What do you think about this? What are your thoughts about emotional sadism? Have you done it before? Are you into it? Do you have a partner who's into it? Let me know again in the comment down below. 
If you're listening not already, please do subscribe. I make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you enjoy this, if you want to support what I do, the best thing to do that is with Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great yesterday and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.